Luke chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 1. Luke chapter 17, verse 1. And as you turn there, I want to give you just a little bit of background in this scripture. Luke 17, you find Jesus teaching, and, and Jesus is doing what he did quite often, is he starts out his conversation or his teaching with a word to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were that religious group, the Jewish religious group that lived by the Torah, and they believed that it was their job to make sure everybody else lived by the Torah, the Old Testament, the, law of the, the laws of God. And that, that all sounds good, but they kind of became the law police and they wanted to put burdens on people that they weren't even willing to, to bear themselves. And, and they found themselves in opposition to Jesus a lot. It's because they loved the attention of men. They loved people thinking that they were holy and righteous. And so whenever Jesus shows up and Jesus doesn't really honor them, and doesn't bow down to them and honor them for the men they think they are. In fact, Jesus spent most of his time with the lowly, the broken, the forgotten, and the down and out. You know that? This is what Jesus did. This is how he spent his time. And it did not impress the Pharisees. As a matter of fact, it irritated them because they didn't get any attention. And when Jesus started healing people, it really bothered them. So what we find here... In fact, you remember the story? Uh, some of you remember the story. If you haven't, it's a cool story. You ought to read it. It's in Luke chapter 5. It's where Jesus um, is, is teaching in a building, and some men come up to the building. They're carrying a friend of theirs, evidently. He's, he's uh, paralyzed, and, and they can't get through the crowd to get to Jesus. And so these guys are, are creative, and they get up on the roof of the building, and they tear the tiles off, and they lower their friend down. Those are good friends. They lower their friend down at Jesus' feet. And then Jesus sees him, and, and Jesus actually does heal him. But Jesus starts out with this phrase. Jesus starts out with saying, friend, your sins are forgiven. And that really irritated. That's really where the beginning of the end was for the Pharisees, as far as Jesus was concerned, because they, they knew that only God could forgive sins. And Jesus just forgave a guy's sins. And, oh, man, they had it out for him. And it only got worse from that time. And now we're all the way up in Luke chapter 17. And Jesus is talking. And the first thing that he says is, it says, he said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. Now, all the scholars that I read in commenting on this said that Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He was talking to his disciples, but it's one of those deals where he's talking to them, but he knows that the Pharisees are hearing him and he wants them to hear him because this is a message to them. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if he had a millstone, if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Again, scholars uh, believe that the little ones that Jesus was referring to were the new believers or potentially even those who weren't believers yet, but they were, they were seeking truth. And the Pharisees were trying to imagine someone on a path toward God. And the Pharisees kept throwing out all these things to trip them up or trying to pull them away. That's the picture that we get here. And Jesus, knowing that he was the only way to God, he was, the, he, was the, he was the only source of life and truth for man in that moment. He was the Messiah. Knowing that, Jesus, it broke his heart that people were being distracted and pulled away by these Pharisees. So he had a, not a lot of patience with them. Stumbling blocks. We want to talk about stumbling blocks for a minute. The word stumbling blocks, the dictionary definition is actually a good one. It means an obstacle to progress, an impediment to belief or understanding. And that's good. That's, that's kind of what it means, an obstacle to progress. Now listen to the New Testament with the Greek word here. It, the Greek word is, comes from the word scandalon, from which we get our word scandal or scandalous. Isn't that interesting? It means a snare or something that offends and also another form of the word in the Greek is scandalizo, which literally means the trigger of a baited animal trap, which is cool because if you think about that, you got a little animal walking down a path and he's probably hungry and he looks over under a rock and he sees a little bait, a little piece of meat or something. He's going, oh, that's good. And he goes over there and he, and he gets under the rock and as he's getting under there, he trips a little stick that's holding the rock up. It's called a deadfall and the rock falls and, and traps the animal or kills the animal. See, I watched Survivor Man. So that's how I know this stuff. And he, and he tries, that little stick is what the word, that's what this re word refers to. It's what sets, it's what triggers the trap. Isn't that interesting? It's not the trap itself, it's what triggers the trap. The Pharisees, they weren't the trap itself, but they were triggering it. They were causing people to turn away from Jesus. And Jesus spoke very clearly to them. 
So we know that Jesus was targeting the Pharisees. But is this scripture applicable to all of us? Causing little ones or younger ones or those seeking God to stumble. Is that applicable to us? We know that Jesus is referring to the world. In fact, in Matthew 18, verse 7, it says, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. So the world has lots of stumbling blocks. The Pharisees had lots of stumbling blocks. But here's a question. Can only unbelievers like the Pharisees or like the world be stumbling blocks to others? Or can Christians be a stumbling block to other people? Is there an example in the Bible of a Christian being a stumbling block to another person? And the answer is yes, there is. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, we're going to read about Peter and, and an encounter with Jesus. This is a really good story, but while you turn there, I want you to think about it. I want to answer your question for you real quick. Have you ever been in this situation where you were maybe sitting in a class or you were the group of people and a question was asked and it was a kind of a hard question and nobody had the answer and you put your hand up because you're like, I think I've got it. And, and you were called on and you answered it in great detail and you were right and everyone kind of went, ooh. You ever had a moment like that? Have anybody, you know, or, 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 or you're with a group of friends and they're talking about something theological or something deeply meaningful and you make a statement and everybody kind of backs them and goes, whoa, that is your, wow. You ever had a moment like that? Does anybody, can you just see your hand? Yeah, a few of you. Yeah, I think more, more than probably you're willing to admit. It's a good moment. It makes you feel good. Peter had a moment like that in the Bible. And Peter, well, I'm going to read it to you. Here's what it says, Matthew 16, verse 13 through 19. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man, meaning himself, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he said? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, now listen to Simon Peter, he jumps into the conversation. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, son of the living God. Whoa, nobody thought of that. If they did, they weren't willing to say it. You are the Messiah, son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you. This is that moment that Peter got it right. Blessed are you, Simon, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that, Peter, on this rock I will build my church. This is getting really good for Peter. Everybody's listening. The disciples are listening. People are going, whoa, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Are you serious? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Seriously? And whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whoa! This is a moment for Peter like he's never had in his life. And none of the disciples had had a moment like this either. And this is a moment in time to remember. It's a Kodak moment. It's filmable. He'll never have it. It was incredible. He was in that moment. Peter had, he had stepped into a world that he had never been in before. Incredible compliments from the Lord and all of his friends hearing this. I'm going to tell you, you know what that did for Peter? It did for Peter what it would do for your eye. He had his head held high. He felt very smart. He felt very wise. And I imagine he's walked with a strut a little bit. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. Jesus just said all the things about whatever he said, being bound on earth and the kingdom and it's the church and whoa. And he's feeling really good about himself. And then we read on. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you answer the question right. And it feels great. And then the next time a question comes around, you raise your hand again and because you know you got the last one right and you answer it and it's dead wrong. And it's just embarrassing. and You want to go hide somewhere. People look at you like, you're not all that. Listen to what happens to Peter. Peter's walking with a strut. Peter feels great about himself. He got it right and he got all these accolades by Jesus. And then read what happens in Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Now, shortly after Peter has that moment in the sun, Jesus is walking with his disciples and he delivers this very difficult news to them. They loved Jesus. They had walked with Jesus. And now he's telling them, guys, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be killed and abused. I will be raised again, but it's not going to be pretty. Now look at what happens in verse 22. Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. 
the student taking the teacher aside and rebuking him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this should never happen to you. This shall never happen to you. Listen to what Jesus said, verse 23. But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. Ouch. Oh, ouch. Can you feel the pain? Because Peter, who felt really good about himself and was walking with his head high and with a strut, is now just got completely rebuked by Jesus. He called him the devil. I mean, if you were there, can you imagine? And Peter's, you know, he takes him aside. The Lord looks at him and Peter's waiting for another compliment. Peter, you did it again. And, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And Peter's, his eyes had to be like this and he had to be walking on seriously. And he was just got totally rebuked by Jesus. This had to be the worst moment in his life. I can imagine crawling off into a corner and just kind of crying for a few days. How did I get it so wrong? My point here is that Jesus called Peter a stumbling block. Peter, a follower of Christ, was a stumbling block. And the source, Jesus identified the source as Satan himself spoke through Peter, who had moments before been spoken to by God. How does that happen? Can that happen to us? Yes, it, ha it can and it does happen to us. Jesus called Peter a stumbling block actually he identified Satan as a stumbling block, and Peter was a vessel who Satan spoke through in that moment. You know, if you back up and you look at the Pharisees and how they responded to Jesus, you have to conclude that Satan was a puppet master, so to speak, behind the Pharisees, manipulating their thoughts, causing them to hate Jesus. Satan was the source of all that. And if that's true, then it only stands to reason that you or I, when we are allowing our thoughts to do exactly what Peter did, he was judging things by the judgment of men and not of God. When we do that, we are open vessels for Satan to speak through. And that's a little scary. And we ought to consider what that means. How important are your words how valuable, how powerful, or how important are the words that you allow to come out of your mouth? Matthew 12, verse 36, says it like this. Matthew 12, verse 36. Every careless word that people speak, every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for in the day of judgment. Every careless word that people speak. This is difficult. This is really difficult. After Jesus finishes this whole dialogue with the Pharisees, the next thing he asks is, Lord, increase our faith. And then in that very next chapter, Lord, next section, Lord, increase our faith, because they're thinking, this is hard. Can we even do this? Every idle word, every careless word we'll give an account for. Listen to what Ephesians 4.29 says. You don't need to turn there. It'll take you too long. But it says this. Ephesians 4.29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Only such a word that's good for edification according to the moment. Edification means the building up of or spiritually uplifting. We allow ourselves to say things out of our own thoughts, out of our own opinions that Satan uses to throw stumbling blocks in front of other people, believers and unbelievers. And, and how does that happen? Hebrews 10.24 says this, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. This is what we're supposed to be about as Christians. Let us consider how to motivate each other, stimulate each other, encourage each other, build an environment for stimulating each other to love and good deeds, helping others, love and good deeds. Just because it is your opinion doesn't mean that it's helpful to say. 
Do you, do you get that? Just because it came to your mind, it's no good reason to say it. Because often the things that come to our mind, they're, they're based on our past and our experience and our attitudes and what we think is right and wrong. And you know what? What we think is right and wrong may not be what is true. And what we think is right in the moment may not be what is right in the moment. And Peter twice said what he thought was right. And one time it was by God, the Holy Spirit. And the other time it was by Satan himself. You cannot. I, I just, I've come to the place where I've recognized I do not trust my own thoughts. I do not. I have to stop before I say anything and I have to ask God to filter it. I have to stop and consider what I'm saying and who I'm saying it to and how it's going to land on them. It sounds difficult, but you know it all happens in milliseconds in your mind. But if you'll stop, I promise you, and you, and you will ask God, Lord, should I say this? God will answer you with a yes or a no. He'll give you a, a guard on your tongue before you say things that are destructive to other people. And many, many, many people had been stumbled or had temptations to fall away because of the things that Christians have said in churches and out of churches. Romans 12, 6, 16 says, Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in your mind, but associate with the lowly. Associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Could you repeat that with me, please? Do not be wise in your own estimation. One more time with a little bit of umph. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Oh, if we could walk with that truth firmly planted in our hearts, I will not walk, be wise in my own estimation. Because that is a breeding ground for arrogance, which is a breeding ground for Satan to come in and use you as a vessel. I've been in churches where business meetings happened. And for some reason, business meetings were the excuse to, for Christians to be mean to each other. And I've watched horrible things happen. I've watched people be mean to each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I really believe most of them were Christians. And they got in arguments and fights because they disagreed with the color of the carpet or the drapes or the paint. I've literally, I sat in a church meeting one time and I watched the lady walk up to the stage and grab another lady by the neck and just start dragging her off the stage. And everybody in the church started applauding. It was a weird moment. I was applauding. Somebody got her off the stage. It should not be in the body of Christ. And how does that happen? We're going to answer that question in just a minute. But here's a question. What if I don't have a problem with something, a habit that I have or a thing that I do? What if I don't have a problem with something but somebody else does? What if I don't have a problem with something that I do, but somebody else does? If it offends another person or may cause them to stumble. Whenever I'm in that situation, I, I employ what I call the idle meat principle. Anybody know what the idle meat teaching in the scripture is? The idle meat, it, it's, it comes in Corinthians 10.24, and the, the picture is this. You've got, um, you've got uh, uh, Christians, Jewish Christians, and you've got Christian Gentile Christians who are starting to connect, okay? The Gentiles who, who worshiped many gods and, and they had idol worship and, and they started becoming Christians. They started meshing with the Jewish Christians and the Jewish Christians completely abhorred idol worship. Of course, they should. I mean, they should. And so should the, the Jewish, uh, the Gentile Christians. They, and they couldn't stand it. What happened was in the marketplace, you could buy meat, steaks or whatever that had been sacrificed. Part of the animal had been sacrificed to, to idols, and you could get a deal on it because it was cheaper because some people didn't want to buy it because part of the animal had been sacrificed to idol. I mean, you got a cow, you want to sacrifice to an idol. You know, you, you want to give it the bones and the guts. You don't want to give it the meat. You can sell the meat, make a little money off that thing, right? It's an idol, right? So you're selling it in the marketplace. The Jewish Christians would not touch that stuff because they felt like this was condoning idol worship. You, I mean, and that makes sense. It stands to reason, right? I mean, it's legitimate concern. But the Gentile Christians, they didn't think it was a big deal. You could get a better deal on the meat. Steaks for cheaper. So let's go with the idol meat. And it really bothered the Jews. The Gentiles had no problems with it. And Paul speaks to that. And, and the principle, well, I'll tell you what it is. First Corinthians 10, 27 says this. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go to a meeting or a gathering, eat anything that is set before you without asking for questions for conscience sake. Just, if some unbeliever invites you to something, don't ask him, is this idle meat? Don't do that. Just whatever's set before you, eat it. There's a reason for this. 
Verse 28. But if anyone says to you, wait, this meat is sacrificed to idols. Do, this meat has been sacrificed to idols. Hey, buddy, did you know? The moment you get that, it says, do not eat it. For the sake of the one who has informed you and for his conscience sake. I don't mean your own conscience, but the other man's. The principle here is one we've got to get as Christians. The principle here is one of self-denial. We should be willing to lay down our own personal rights for the sake of maintaining unity in the body of Christ. And for the sake of the spiritual growth of another brother, it takes priority over our personal freedoms and our personal rights. And there are lots of examples here, but I'm going to give you one that I think is very simple and I think it's very adequate. If you like to pop the top on a beer to have a steak in your house and you pop the top on a beer and you're enjoying this beer, you're not going to drink 12, you're going to drink one, you like the taste, you've enjoyed it since you were young, I cannot find a scripture that tells you that's a sin. But if you got a guy visiting you and he's in recovery because alcohol has destroyed his life, you would probably be wise and loving to take that beer and put it in the fridge in the back and not let him see it. Some people would call that phony or disingenuous. The scripture calls it self-denial for the sake of another person. You give up your own personal freedoms when necessary so somebody else won't stumble. If there's even a hint that they may stumble, you give up some of your personal freedoms because you don't want them to stumble. You see, you're caring more about them than you are about your personal freedoms. And that's just one example. Now hear me again. If I was a, a liker of beer, I, I might have been, but I, I never liked it. I, I, used to, I used to go pick it. My dad would say, go to the fridge and give me a beer, boy. And I'd go in there and I'd grab a bush or a whatever and I'd bring it to him and I'd, I'd pop it and I'd take a sip on the way and I'd go, oh, why does he like this stuff? I never really developed a taste for beer. I like all a lot, kinds of other stuff, Diet Coke, uh, cream soda. I like that a lot. Werner's ginger ale, oh, I love that stuff, but not beer. If I liked beer and I wanted one and nobody was around and I was at home with my family and that was not a problem, I would drink a beer. But listen, we have to come to the place where we recognize and we're constantly communing with God, talking with God, Lord, is this good? Stop and look about who we're, look at who we're with. This is such an important issue that Paul actually <laughs> gives some verses to this. It's the idle meat principle. Self-denial. And then he sums it up in verse 31 by saying, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Stop and consider your actions and how they're landing on other people, how they affect other people. Because the last thing you want to do is cause someone to stumble or, or tempt them to stumble. Do we understand how important this is? This is so important. What this is saying to people is that we love you more than we love ourselves. And we're so, we so want you to know the Lord and grow in, in your faith that we're willing to step aside from our own preferences. Now I'm going to pick up. That was Luke 17, one, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to pick up in verse 3. Listen to what it says. This is another subject that Jesus kind of turned the page on. He says, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. This is a difficult verse. This is one we need to talk about for a second. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Some people would have a heyday with that. Some people like to rebuke people. Some people, they are just, they're wired to confront I would say to you, if that's you, you are not qualified to confront these people. If you like confronting other people, you're disqualified. Because this kind of confrontation is difficult. It is hard to confront someone who you know has sinned, and you've got to go to them and talk about it. It's difficult. In fact, I think if it's easy for a person to confront, I, I, you know, you just give me the job. I'll go tell them all. What's all. And you know, I think you're not the person. Do you understand what I'm saying? If it's too easy for you to correct somebody, you probably should step back and give it to somebody that it's hard, it's difficult for. God clearly needs this to happen, but it's got to happen right. If your brother sins, rebuke him. 
Let's look at the word rebuke for a second. It means to check, to silence, or to put down. Those are strong terms. It means correction or instruction. It's to express sharp, stern disapproval of, to reprove or reprimand. Jesus did not look over to Peter and say, Now, Peter, you shouldn't have said that. Peter, think about what you said. Now, let's just stop and back up. And you might want to rephrase. Didn't he? Did he do that? Get behind me, Satan. He couldn't have spoken in any more painful and sharp tones. Get behind me, Satan. The words you said are not from God, but from man, the mind of man. In the church, people that are known to be troublemakers. In, in churches, the history that I have in churches from 1972 and on have been, there's always someone in the church who's the mean person or the troublemaker or that we call them church bosses. We we're pretty sure they thought they owned the pastor and the church because they had given money and they, they had bought part of it. You know what I mean? They had invested and they wanted to, to, to uh, cash in some of their investment by telling everybody what they thought. They were church bosses, mean people, unkind people. I think every church I've been a part of, and except for the last two, to be honest with you, have had church bosses or mean people or people that just, just don't mess with them, you know, just let them alone. The problem is when, when we don't mess with them, when we just let them alone, you know how much damage is done by that person? I worked at a church where the janitor would just go off on people. He would just go off on people. And it's like, but he's a janitor, you know, he's had a troubled life. He used to be an alcoholic. It's, it's, he's got to be, no, this guy should have been rebuked 20 times. He should have been rebuked every time he wounded somebody. But nobody wanted to mess with him, right? So we just let him talk. We let him wound people. And when one of us says something that's just stupid and it ought to be corrected, somebody should pull us aside if it's damaging and say, you know what, how how horrible what you just said was now let me back up and say this i work with the college students and i love it and we met last night we meet every saturday night um we also meet on wednesday nights and um, that was a plug and and we and 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 i there's now it's grown to 20 to 25 or so on a good night 18 or so on the average night and 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 now in three months of meeting together i have not had we've had one reason to rebuke anyone in that group now we're talking college students having fun and talking and laughing, there's not been one reason to rebuke anybody in that group. I'm not talking about every little thing that we say, every little mistake that we make. I'm not talking about that. Because then we become little rebuking police, and that's just no fun, and that's not what was intended here. This is intended when somebody clearly offends or hurts or wounds somebody else and has no problem with it. That needs to be dealt with. And when it's not dealt with, when we shrink back, see, we take that verse that says, don't be judged or you'll be, do not judge others or you'll be judged. You know the verse where you all say, well, I don't want to mess with that. I don't want to judge somebody else. That has nothing to do with the person's behavior. That's about their eternal security. We're not to judge whether somebody's going to go to heaven or hell. That's God's to do. But when it comes to behavior and how we respond to each other and how we function in the church, clearly Jesus says, we got to deal with this stuff. And you got somebody who goes around wounding people and, with their words and filleting people and hurting people. And, you know, I grew up in a family of, of sharp-tongued people, and I was the worst offender. I was such a sarcastic person. I thought it was funny. My, my heroes were George Carlin and Cheech and Chong and Steve Martin, and I thought these guys were funny. They made me laugh. And some of you know who that is. Others are thinking, I don't know who that is. Or I'm a kid now. And I grew up with a sharp tongue, and, and, and I would... I would get out of everything with my words. I could talk real fast and I could say lots of stuff and I could kind of fillet you. And I was always in trouble with people. In fact, I, I had learned to run really fast with my head to run and I'd be calling people names and keep running because I was getting beat up by people. I wasn't a good fighter, but I could talk you into a corner, make people mad at me. And one day, my sons and I, we had started a youth group. This is a church that, I, that we planted before we came here. We were in our youth group of 15 to 17, 20 or so students and we started noticing we were really like hurting each other with our words. We were, we were too sarcastic. And, and it kind of came to the surface. And we saw it one day. And, and I had to go to my sons and say, guys, this was me. I brought this in, in the family. I'm the reason you're all so sarcastic. I'm the reason we're all trying to be funny by filleting everybody else. And we've got to stop it because we're hurting each other with our words. And, and it's funny, but it's horrible. Can we agree to stop? And my sons looked at me, all three of them. 
at that point. My daughter was too young to be in the group and said, yeah, you know, Dad, we know you're right, and we're going to work at it. And I mean, that group changed its personality over the next few months, and it became a, a, a really helpful, loving, warm, encouraging environment to be in rather than this funny group that was always sarcastic. Our words are more powerful than we know. Fathers, what you say to your children, to your spouse, moms, what you say, how you control or do not control your emotions, what we let come out of us is so powerful. If we only knew just how powerful it is, we would repent and change our ways. And how do you do this? How do you how do you take every word that comes to your mouth and, and, and screen it? There is a way, and God calls us all to do it. When we refuse to rebuke when someone clearly sins, several things happen, and I want to look at them real quick. Number one, the offender may not even be aware that their habit is offensive. Did you know that? For years, I didn't said things that wounded other people, and not until someone came to me and got in my face about it that I realized how much damage I had done. When we refuse to rebuke someone, when they continually hurt other people or throw out stumbling blocks, we don't even give them opportunity to realize we don't even shine the light of truth. They needed to be rebuked, to know the seriousness of their offense, and they need correction and instruction so that they can stay in a right relationship with God. They couldn't figure out why they're always distant from God because their words were so destructive. If we do not rebuke also, number two, if not rebuked, corrected, and instructed, the offending person will most likely repeat this and hurt someone else. And so one person has literally caused damage in many people's lives because we refused to do the hard work of going and confronting a thing. And number three, the reputation of Christ and his church is often damaged by Christians who are allowed to continue in their sinful, destructive behavior. And it should not be so. Personally, for me, I have, as a pastor, I've had people in, in churches that I've been a part of and should have spoken to that were really destructive and offensive. And I didn't want to go be the one to lower the boom, so I let it happen. Shame on me. I will not let it happen anymore. Love demands that we go to a person and correct them when they need to be corrected. You know, you got to know that right after Jesus rebuked Peter, Jesus didn't ignore Peter for the next three months, or not even three days. He rebuked him sternly and then went on and continued to do what he did. And what that was was loving and teaching his disciples how to live and how to teach others and how to be a blessing and how to serve God. And this is what Jesus did for Peter. When you rebuke someone, it's okay to follow it with a hug or with a prayer. You need to. We separate them by rebuking, but we don't let that distance remain, or we wound them. We wound them, and we're as guilty as what they did. We must rebuke, correct, and instruct another Christian when they sin, or the consequences, the entire body suffers. Now, back up to that scripture, in verse, we're going to pick up in verse 4 as I close this out. It says, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And then verse 4, the one that we go, seriously? And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Are you serious? Seven times a day? We have trouble forgiving someone if they sin against us seven times a year. Or, 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 and, and a li- am I right? Last year, you asked me the same thing. You know what? And I think I'm fed up with it. No. Seven times a day? Jesus is making a point here. He's he's trying to hammer this thing down. If somebody comes to you and they truly are repentant, I was talking with my son Nate last night on the phone. He teaches at YWAM School of the Bible. We were talking about this, and he said, well, remember, Dad, because I was talking about repentance and how easy that can be for people. I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? And he he reminded me. Dad, remember, the word repentance actually means a complete turn of direction. The word repentance means 180 degrees turn going the other direction. And repentance is not a light thing. Hey, I'm really sorry. It's okay. Are you okay? I'm okay. It's not what it is. It is a substantial, serious, man, I see the error of my ways. I know how to struggle. Would you please forgive me? I am going to stop that. And the point Jesus makes here is when somebody comes to you with true repentance, you are not to be the judge whether that is genuine or not. That is not your, your job. Our calling is to forgive. 
and forgive and forgive. Now, this throws up a huge question I've got to answer. What happens if they don't come and ask you to forgive them? Do you just hold that in and stay bitter towards them or not like them? No. Remember Jesus on the cross being crucified by all these people? Remember what he said? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Not one person asked Jesus to forgive them in that moment, did they? No. Jesus forgave them, all of them, for what happened. We forgive people whether they ask or not. This is not about us holding a grudge against them or not forgiving them. We forgive them regardless. This is what I, we want to call relational forgiveness, where someone breaks the relationship by sinning against me. And that relationship is broken because of that sin. And when they come to me and repent, I open the door again to that relationship. We are now connected. We're reconnected. But as that sin stands, we're not. It's kind of like if a husband abuses his, his wife and hits her and hurts her, and he goes off and he's unfaithful, and he comes back, and he hasn't said he's sorry. That relationship is broken. It is broken, and it's, not, it's irreparable. You can't even touch it until repentance happens. And even after repentance, there's got to be a lot of healing in that thing. Am I right? But you can't carry on a relationship where there's no repentance, when there's these offenses. It's, relation, it's a break in relationship. And when we forgive someone because they repent, we're saying, I open the door back up to my heart to being vulnerable to you again. I forgive you. We, we can't say to someone, I forgive you, but to keep the door closed. Those are just words. To forgive someone is to truly forgive them. Now, we may not forget what they did. It may still hurt us deeply. We may have to work through it. I forgive you. But we forgive everyone, whether they ask it or not. Otherwise, literally, you know what unforgiveness is in you? It is a cancer, and it builds and builds and builds until it controls who you are and what you think, and it darkens everything about you. We are called to forgive. Unconditional forgiveness. The same forgiveness God offers us. How many of you in your early Christian days had to go to God many times a day and ask for forgiveness? Right? This is how it works. And the more we ask, the closer, the more we draw near to him. And the more he forgives us, the more our hearts are, are endeared to God. And this is how we treat each other. We forgive, we forgive, we forgive. It makes no sense sometimes, but we forgive because of the work God has done in us. I want to ask you today, just really for a moment, if you're a Christian and unforgiveness stands in your heart, or you know you've been offended or wounded by someone else, or maybe you're the offender and the wounder. Can we just close our heads and right now pray for just a second? And I want to ask you just very quickly, if you think you may be an offender, you think you may be someone that Satan uses and speaks through, and you, could you ask God to show you if that's true? Would you ask God to confirm? You know God will do that for you. If you ask God for direction, He will give you direction. That's a promise in His Word. Lord, would you put somebody in my path, in my life, to speak to me and show me what I'm doing wrong? To at least let me know I'm, I'm an offender. God, would you help me to forgive the person for what they've done to me? Would you help me, God? Lord, if I need to go to somebody that's deeply wounded me and tell them, even with tears or even with yelling, and, and sharp rebuke. God, give me the courage to do it. 